Dear friends, I want to make this proposal to you. Today there is almost nothing to build, and if we build anywhere, it is in order to live. Or are you lucky enough to be working on a nice commission? My daily routine almost makes me sick, and it is basically the same for all of you. As a matter of fact, it is a good thing that nothing is being built today. Things will have time to ripen. We shall gather our strength, and when the building begins again, we shall know our objectives and be strong enough to protect our movement against botching and degradation. Let us consciously be imaginary architects. We believe that only a total revolution can guide us in our task. Our fellow citizens, even our colleagues, quite rightly suspect in us the forces of revolution. Break up and undermine all former principles. Dung! We are the bud in the fresh earth. With colour and glass greetings, glass. You're listening to a podcast about buildings and cities. I'm Luke Jones. And I'm George Gingell. Last week we were with Bruno Taut during the dark times of the war, dreaming of crystal cities and a return to the land. When the war finally ended, he sensed an opportunity to enter the political stage himself and to enact some of the changes he had up to that point only drawn or written. This week we're going to explore Taut's brief foray into politics, his failure, the chaos and violence of post-war Germany, and his return one final time to the glass dream in the company of the secret brotherhood of correspondence known as the Crystal Chain. During the collapse of the imperial German state at the end of the war, there was a period of revolutionary politics and the socialist tout was swept up in the creation of a myriad of Soviets or workers' councils across the country. As the old order was swept away, the whole form of the future state, economy and even world order seemed to open up. When Tao initiated the Crystal Chain correspondence in November of 1919, it was at the end of an incredible, tumultuous, bloody 12 months. At the end of October, there were uprisings and strikes in the naval dockyards, uh, which quickly spread across the country. On the 9th of November, a republic was declared in Berlin and the Kaiser resigned and fled the country. At this point, workers' councils were forming all over the nation. On the 11th of November, the armistice was signed and the war effectively came to an end. The state is in collapse. What was it, about 18 months before the civil government had basically ceased to exist already. So part of the reason why it's quite straightforward to overthrow the civil administration is because it almost doesn't exist. It's just the army who control everything. And they're quite happy to see the Kaiser go and things like that. Well, they're not happy, but there's nothing you can really do about it. Um, And they thought for a moment, actually, they might be able to hold on and and have some room for manoeuvre. But everything fell apart. And the force that sort of is going to reunite the country eventually is that the soldiers are going to come home from the front. And they're going to combine with people who are terrified about a complete collapse of social order. And those two groups are going to come together and there's not going to be room. But it seems for a moment before the soldiers get back... There's, there's no coercive force, forces in the state. Everything collapsed. There's this great moment of excitement. All these fretful, hungry people yeah. have ideas that finally they can be free of what has been for a long time a very coercive state. Bruno and like-minded avant-gardists decide that they need to get in on the act and they form this organisation called the Arbeitsrat für Kunst, which is like the Workers' Council for Art. Well, in in this book, it calls it the Working Council for Art. It's basically the Artists and and Architects Soviet, and it's particularly for the radicals. Among various leaders during uh, its early days were Tout himself, Walter Gropius, Adolf Biener. So should we just talk a little bit about what they're about? They want to be a governing Soviet, but they want to be a special sort of governing Soviet because they believe architects are the natural head of um, the plastic arts, which is probably the main thing society does. They want to be the first among equals. It's like a group of hippie artists getting together and saying that they want to become world dictator. The ideology, at least in its early days of the Arbeitsrat, um, in, shares a lot with some of the projects that we discussed in the last episode. This sense of the necessity of leading the people through geistig inspiration, artists and architects as leaders and this kind of unifying project of pursuing beauty together. Can I describe what their parliament was going to be like? Yeah, no, this sounds great. So there was um, a lower chamber called the Reichstag, 
which would be a kind of representative, freely elected, proportionally representative chamber of the kind which German, Germany has now. Um, and there would be an upper chamber called the, um, the Rat der Geistigen, which is an assembly of inspirational Nietzschean Geistig leaders who would just assemble themselves because they would know that they belonged there. People like Tout, essentially all the people who are in this crazy organisation with him. Yeah. The, idea. Yeah. the artists, the inspired. So it's like you take the House of Lords and you fill it with self-appointed hippies. Isn't it funny how um, when people pr- propose like strange systems of government, somehow they're always at the top of them? Yes. <laughs> they attempt to kind of refocus their goals towards more specifically cultural ends. They have a go at going to see the new social democratic minister of culture to try and talk to them about their demands for the, how the new museums should be. There's a scene described in the Ian Boyd White book where they all go to see the minister of culture to demand the removal of various like old guard who've been running the museums. And while they're waiting outside, all the people they all walk no no they all walk out having just been reconfirmed um, in their post. One of the things which is kind of amazing during this period is that all this planning, all of this dreaming is going on against a background of extraordinary political upheaval and violence. During late December, parts of Berlin are literally seized by the Spartacists who are of like far left grouping who are unhappy with the compromises made by the mainstream social democrats. They have guns. They, they break into arms depots. Unfortunately, they have miscalculated the strength of the forces ranged against them, which turn out to be, as you've alluded to, all of these returning irregular soldiers who've kept all their weapons, the free corps. Often it's, 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 it's simpler than that. They are whole military units. Yeah. They're called free corps, but often they're just military units under their commanders with all their equipment, including captured tanks and artillery and yeah there are some extraordinary photos that you can see of uh, um, there's one i've seen of a cap a captured british tank being driven down a street in berlin uh, it begins more or less at the beginning of the new year and lasts until about mid-january it's dealt with it's dealt with and like it's very good because it rounds up all the people you want to kill and it kills them I can't say it's very good. <laughs> in, that, in that sense, highly effective. It's highly... It's, incidentally, there's some, yeah. uh, later that year, um, a, a tank would be used in Glasgow to put down um, rioting workers, which is another good photograph. <laughs> and it's against this backdrop that Tout decides that what is needed is an exhibition bringing together the imaginative efforts of visionary architects from all over the country. And that will become the exhibition of unknown architects. So it, the, the call, I think, goes out while... While the blood is literally while running the revol- in the streets. I think the revolt... <laughs> I, think they're ju- I think like the tanks are just about to come in. And it's quite popular. They get lots and lots of submissions. People from all over the country are interested. Around this time, I think, in recognition of the fact that his own... There is he's, a, there's a he's transition... He's frustrated. He has got no... I think he's got something that you get again and again in the letters that we'll come on to later. Is that he's got no interest in trying to do politics. He despises all that sort of stuff. So essentially, leadership of the Arbeitsrat passes to... Uh, very important figure, Walter Gropius, who will go on to found the Bauhaus. And with him, uh, a few of the sort of leading architects of the day. And they changed the organisation from being a Soviet council of everyone talks together in a room to a organised, closed hierarchy with them at the top. And then they get on with organising very quickly and effectively. We're in January. We're in the new year. The exhibition itself happens in April. Uh, and it's quite well attended. Uh, people will come and look at the stuff, but they won't necessarily take it very seriously. Yeah. They look at the they look at like um, you know the the rose coloured uh, Alps made of crystals, and they think this is lovely. It's lovely. I'll have it in my he, in my living room. And he's very grumpy that they don't take him completely seriously. I think at this point he's not. I think in a place of total disillusionment. But that I. Th- think is somewhere that he will get to quite quickly very shortly after the exhibition is on at the right at the end of april of 1919 there is another uprising involving his friend gustav landauer whose book uh call to socialism he had read and obviously taken a lot from during the war it happens in munich 
the seize control of the government. The, the events which lead up to it are a bit complicated, and I don't fully understand them myself, but the, the upshot of it is that this group seize control. They propose an independent socialist state in Bavaria, and Tout is invited he's invited to come to to Munich to take up the post of something like Minister for Building, a kind of head of the nationalised Bavarian building industry. And it's this extraordinary opportunity to enact in the real world all of these very cherished ideas. Unfortunately, as you would expect, the German state and the German sort of military forces don't take this line down. And the revolution is suppressed by the Freikorps under Noska very violently. They're all taken out and shot in the street, essentially. All of these things happen in almost the time it takes to sort of tell everybody something's going to happen and get them together. So, yeah, so it's like the revolution is like there for like less than two weeks, I think. Yeah, I yeah. They're sort of agitating for a couple of months and then they sort of get in control, but only for the amount of time it takes for the army to arrive. Uh, fortunately, Tout is slower than the army. Tout is basically packing up his stuff to go yeah. at the moment when Landauer and everyone else are being murdered. And it's a big blow to him. Tout is someone who's had a succession of has a succession of these sort of father spiritual leader figures. There's Sheerbart. They act like his guiding light. They're the thing he can channel. He can sort of push their vision. Yeah. Sheerbart couldn't cope with the war he hated the conflict and drunk himself to death landauer shot in the street he keeps going he hasn't given up on the ideas but he is but he's starting to think that gropius had the right idea when he said that they should be secretive that they should work in small groups like a masonic lodge yeah Yeah. um in order to stay stay out of politics and uh yeah. yeah well Gropius is happy to put aside his his political ambitions full stop. Bruno's not. No. Bruno is only actually interested in his... Like, having gone through the things in detail, it is clear to me that the politics is key, but very strange. And we will go on about that more. Entering the summer, in at the end of June on the 28th, the Treaty of Versailles is signed, which brings the war officially to an end. It involves all kinds of massive concessions on the part of the German state and creates yeah this this sense of like outrage there and, other pe- there are other people on the internet who can tell you about um what happened with the tr- yeah. treaty of versailles yeah it was <laughs> it was on balance probably do, there, there do, were some do, things do, that could have been done better <laughs> let's not even talk about it let's not even talk about it and um, a couple of weeks later on the 11th of august the constitution of the weimar republic is officially adopted and the 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 kind of successor state to the second empire is in place yeah. i mean and part of this is that even the workers councils have decided to support parliamentary government uh, rather than anarcho syndicalism yeah ecstatic geistig union yeah uh, even yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> so there we are um in november like for, for me it absolutely makes sense that it's from this place of defeat and of wanting to keep going but looking for a new way of doing it that he writes to a select body chosen from among the exhibitors at the Exhibition for Unknown Architects, inviting them to begin a group correspondence uh, which will become named Die Gläserne Kette, the Crystal Chain, although that name arrives a bit later. We heard the invitation to that at the beginning of the programme. So so he sends it off to a number of people, 13 I think, and gets the res- he asks for them to... Um, provide him with a pseudonym if they want to join the group. And he's got the replies, and then he writes this out to everyone. Friends, everyone except Adolf Behner has agreed. He has doubts about the main purpose of the project, which I don't personally share. Even if he is right, perhaps he would rather be an outsider as a writer. However, he has nothing against our cause. Gropius has expressed doubts, but has nevertheless declared his willingness. The rest, without exception, have agreed enthusiastically. Hermann Finsterlin has written a beautiful letter in which he ponders on my idea of fusing together and, if I understand him correctly, stresses his own preference for individuality. He wants to be a magician rather than a medium, is pleased at what we're doing, but does not want to see individual freedom eliminated. Why might anyone be confused at what Hermann Finsterlin was writing? 
this is a bit of a motif of the correspondences that, <laughs> that um, Hermann Finsterlin, who chooses the pseudonym Promethe, Prometheus, writes incredibly long letters which are almost completely impossible to understand. The difficulty of translating them is noted in the preface. Which starts with, given that they are incomprehensible in German, it is hard to <laughs> communicate exactly it's what quite, he was trying to yeah, go on about. It's quite, quite droll. First, I think it would be nice to just set out what Tout has said he wants the group to do quite clearly, which is that they're going to be a brotherhood and they're going to exchange ideas to uh, create the new vision that's going to inspire everybody towards this new state. Uh, at once, they're going to be a secret society trying to sort of undermine the state. And he says, we're radicals, yeah. we're revolutionaries, but there's a revolution that is going to be spiritual and is going to be ecstatically inspired. All the people will be united together with the cause of building this new architectural expression, which will be almost so beautiful and so it will be so imbued with the pure spirit of Geist that, that people are drawn to it. And so they're coming together to create this spirit and use it to overthrow the state and create paradise. It's quite hard to understand You've got to understand, he's serious about overthrowing the state and the world order. He's not interested in anything that's less than that. But he believes that the the only effective way to do that, the only effective way is to spiritually inspire people with his paintings. The state and the architecture are the same thing, which is kind of a peculiar thing. And not and, and, and the state is almost the wrong word. Yeah. Because it will not be a state, it will be a united people. People will be united by the architecture and driven to create it. What they're searching for is the possibility of this architecture. This is the bud which they're trying to plant. So let's go through some of the contributors. He mentions the reservations of Gropius from the start. Gropius, who chooses the pseudonym Mass, meaning like weight, measure, proportion, never says anything. He apparently writes some private letters to Tout, which are lost. Um, there are a lot of private letters going around. You can you can hear about them in the correspondence. The correspondence that we have are things that are, that are all sent out to everybody. Yeah. It's probably worth saying at this point that like there was a specific requirement. You were meant to produce it on a size of one size of tracing paper, and then make photostat copies and mail them to all of the other contributors. It may actually have been A4. Well, like, Dean ISO paper sizes probably, probably existed at this point. They too. probably did. He says filing paper. I don't really know what that means. It, yeah. could, it could be, yeah, A4. They were very, um, ad- very advanced. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, all our standards. All our standards come from Germany, except yeah. for bicycles, when they come from the Birmingham Small Arms Manufactory. <laughs> <laughs> they, so Gropius says very little. Boehner, who um, sits out the correspondence altogether, was um, a well-known architectural theorist uh, who has a famous book on functionalism which I don't know anything about and like very famous very famous so famous that even people who are like obsessively into the subject have literally not heard of it the youngest member of the correspondence who doesn't he does say a few things but they're not really we're not going to talk about them very much is a guy called Hans Sharoon who becomes a very prominent architect in after the second world war And he has two famous buildings in Berlin, the Philharmonic Hall and the State Library, which is very beautifully shot in Wim Wenders' Wings of Desire, which is quite, in many ways, quite a, like, sort of Schiavartian vision. And the the Philharmonie is is quite like that, too. They're both really lovely buildings, and both won on competition, I think. The Philharmonie, obviously, he'd moved on from this. But I think that there is a flavour of it still. You know, the Philharmonie from the outside has this kind of magic mountain kind of look to it, this gold spiky thing on the top. He was there. Yeah. He was there. And the inside of it is this kind of slightly kind of fractal landscape of uh, of seating. And Sharoon is the main source of the existing archive. About two thirds of what we have is from him. Yeah, I mean, what we've got is a stitch together. I don't think it's complete... No. Um, it's a stitch together from mainly Sharoon and um, uh, one of the other guys. Who I forgot uh, the name I think of. it's Harblick. Yeah, think Har- Harblick. Wenzel, yeah, Wenzel Harblick. And then a few bits and bobs from all over the place, like like individual ones. And, and uh, people have, over the years, undertaken this massive scholarly exercise of recomposing yeah. the, 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 the chain itself. Yeah. 
The other thing while we're talking about the general features of them is that they are, I think that you lose in translation is a lot of them are handwritten and some of them are very beautifully, these kind of very yeah, beautiful flowing um, They will be written writing. on top of the drawing or, yeah. or the, the, the lines of text will form drawings, yeah. swirls and patterns. Very beautiful. Oh, and the, uh, the I mean, the other thing is that the uh, the method of reproduction is a sort of motif that reappears because people are always running out of... Hectograph paper. Yeah. <laughs> Hectograph. It's photostats. It's like, um, I think it's like a, a gelatin resist. Yeah. It's a kind of precursor to photocopying. It's essentially yeah, it's a, a... it's a photographic process using, like, jelly. This isn't the only thing that Tao is doing at the same time, and his other outlet, which occasionally crops up, is a, a supplement to an architectural magazine called, called... Which is like the sort of technical buildings journal. It's very bizarre. It's a, Yeah, it's a supplement to like an incredibly like technical detail-style magazine. It's this thing called Frühlicht, um, Early Light, which, again, is... It's much of a, you know... Which has got kind of like new dawn kind of connotations to it, I think. And he does these magazines which are full of like weird poems about horses and strange manifestos and lots of kind of ink, ink drawings of impossible structures. And when the thing is eventually cancelled, they say <laughs> well, they, they say something like, we, are, we remain very interested in incorporating um, the ideas and output of a younger generation of architects, but we would like them to be technically realisable. Yes, he writes this fantastic... In the correspondence... I mean, it's a letter we're not going to talk about, I expect. He writes this fantastic letter, which says, I've decided to give up publishing Frulish. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bruno. Really because nice. of these terrible intransigent... I've had the idea for a long time that I might stop doing it. <laughs> yes. So we've heard the opening letters, and there's immediately very kind of joyous. People are on a spectrum of how ecstatic they, they are and, and feel about things. Even the non-ecstatic people have some lovely letters when they're talking about, like people will have experienced, you're walking out in the world and you see nature and its beauty and you're inspired by its energy. Uh, and, and you think, this is lovely and I'm feeling a sort of oneness with the world. Yeah. And that's something that a lot of the early letters are trying to capture. Yeah, I find that that's kind of quite a kind of post-hungover phenomenon sometimes. How you, you get it? Oh, <laughs> post, I don't Post-hangover it. kind of sweet melancholy. <laughs> Let's hear like a quick excerpt. This is f- uh, from uh, Vasily Lukhart. Sacken, uh, spines or spikes. Or peaks, it turns out, like mountain tops. While walking in the Thuringian woods, I often stood on one of the summits and gazed across the fir clad hills. Thousands and thousands of treetops, united into vast areas and covering distant hills, seemed to climb at right angles toward the sky each treetop proclaiming the driving force of its growth in its upward thrust. And it was the same, looking at a ripe cornfield, as the wind blew over millions of ears of corn, which, swaying beneath the pressure, brushed lightly against each other. In this undulation, a morsel of infinity seemed to be revealing itself to me. There's a lot of rather lovely writing like that, and what they will then go on to say is, this ecstatic feeling... I can't defend it as rational, but our our new architecture must have something of it. And that, I think, very much was in the sort of object of the group. That's the one thing that unites them. But where the divine inspiration comes from, there are a lot of contradictions that are immediately apparent. There's a lot of discussion of, like, does it come from nature? Some people are really against nature. They believe in sort of abstract... um, Bruno Taut talks a lot about we must produce an intellectual framework... Um, aside from anything in nature or reality. Yeah, what an intellectual framework means. He's not a a guy naturally given to frameworks, I would say. When he says intellectual framework, he means, like, inspiration that makes sense. Yeah. And there are a lot of... I mean, I don't think we're going to particularly pick out these these themes, so I think it's okay to introduce them. There are a lot of sort of general gripes about culture. There's a lot of the sort of thing that if you've got a load of, like, second years to talk about it, a lot of people saying, like, everything we're learning is holding us back... And Prometheus, Finsterlin, is the big one for this. It may well be that he never gets to the point, but his point is, or like certainly, certainly, certainly something he believes is that um, everyone must have no education at all, yeah. and in fact, the fu- in the future, no one will have any education. There will be no knowledge. And he's not the only person. Um, Tancred, an- another guy in the group, also believes that everything you learn is actually 
it's kind of like Scientology. Yeah. Everything you learn is actually all the stuff that's like preventing you from being in touch with the Geist. And you start, you're like born able to do everything in the universe and you learn things and they prevent you from doing stuff. And that is some... Um, that's very much so. The so the the, um, the kind of mission statement is going to be that they're going to retreat from the world in order to formulate the new untainted architecture. But the question of how far they're retreating is is one of the things that's at issue. You allude to this problem of whether forms from nature are allowed or whether forms should come wholly from um, you know divine inspiration, the spirit of the universe. There are also these discussions, or whether you know worship of crystals is allowed. Whether the um, worship of like stars, you know, stars as inspiration for buildings, whether any of these things are and allowed. Also, is there anything worth keeping in existing social structures, culture, and material culture? There is a sort of relationship which goes like most of the people think there is, and most of the people think you can take inspiration from everything. Yeah. But the like more the person writes, the less they believe that. Yeah. The the real core of the group are at the more ecstatic end. It's not quite Dada, but there's an interest in kind of nonsense or non-seriousness, which comes through sometimes, but which I think... Well, they get called out. People go, you're, you're being like a Dadaist. You're as bad as the Dadaists. Yeah. One guy keeps saying to Prometheus, everything you say is just like a string of words. It's just words put together. So here's, some, here's a quick quote on some spiritual beliefs. Paul Gutsch, Tancred... He's the most religious, but he believes that we're all perpetually reincarnated and that the architecture, if you can imagine like a real West Coast sort of idea of Buddhism, which also involves a lot of LSD, the like Nirvana is going to be brought about by the building culture. That's what's it's like that. But all the rest of the sort of reincarnation and um, reaching for the light and the spirit yearning to be free of the flesh and all that's it's quite straightforwardly religious which is one of the visions there are all these different visions coming out yes building is death death is life it's the uh, enigmatic aphorism which he he uh, he signs off with yeah he's but, got he's got all kinds of uh... but he also is someone who um all of these people at the same we mustn't concentrate too much on what they're saying they're all contributing drawings and images and they're all different um Finstelins, i mean someone we've talked about he is prodigiously productive with these drawings which are sort of biomorphic, scrolly architectural sketches. And he's got a strong thing that he believes that plan, like any scale, scale is irrelevant. And like whether it's a plan, a section, elevation, an axo, they should all be the same. No. This is very wrong thinking if you're ever proposing to do a building. Um, lots of people still have it though. Tancreds are much less kind of the overall form of the building and they're much more these kind of highly decorated um, sort of grotto-like spaces in which there are these semi-recognisable forms but which are crawled all over by these highly abstract um, kind of trailing geometrical creepers which look like nothing so much as kind of, I don't know, frozen icicles or something. And also there's a different approach to how you should draw between them. So... Uh, at, at one end, there's Tancred, who believes everything should be loose and childlike yeah. and inspirational. It's, it, his things are watercolours and they're in beautiful bright colours. And his his graphics are, are, are very appealing, actually. He's quite good. Um, and right at the other end are the Luckhart brothers. Their drawings are almost photographic in their rendering. and They're yeah. really tight and crisp, really quality draftsmen. A very crystalline. Very um, and also extremely definite. Yep. They look they look very buildable. Actually, they're resolved. Hans Hansen, anti Schmitz, uh, introduces this concept of the Bauhof, which you can read kind of as an alternative crystal chain vision of the Bauhaus. It's a community of architects and makers living in this in this complex, which includes all of the uh, facilities for different sorts of manufacturing and construction and which is also a place of training. But it is very different. It has this uh, extremely spiritual character. There's a nice um, drawing of it, which comes from um, a later publication, in which it looks... It has these sort of stupa-like forms. It looks a little bit like some kind of temple complex, although extremely ambiguous in its inspiration. At one end, you've got one of these um, sort of tout-like crystal kingdoms, and it progresses back in a linear fashion 
through gardens, workshops, factories with smokestacks and the sort of and, and, and within it the activities are segregated and there is also a hierarchy. You yeah. progress towards the spiritual light of this thing going through stages. Which, whereas in the Bauhaus it's all about mixing everybody up together and the idea that we're going to be productive by all seeing what each other are doing, this is about siloing and making hierarchical, more like a monastery, but one where the element of work is very much emphasised and the hierarchy is emphasised. This, in a way, is the first phase. They are articulating their kind of different overlapping visions, but quite soon the question arises what the output of the group should be, what they should do together. And it's Wenzel Harblick, who goes under the pseudonym WH, who suggests the project of the book. So Wenzel Harblick comes up with this idea of the book and the dynamic of the few letters that are sort of produced about it I think tells you a lot about how the, the crystal chain works which is that he has this manifesto letter quite early on in which he says we must gather together to make the book in inverted commas and it will, insp- it will be our product we'll put all our hearts into it and it will inspire the new society and that will be the channel through which we can create this utopian dream and he talks about it as a replacement for the Bible and as this new, we're going to create a new religion. And then Tout goes on to say, I'm very much behind this. I completely agree. And we will, it's, he's sort of talking like if they're making, uh, I keep going back to Lord of the Rings references, but it's really like that. And it will be chastened and embossed. The clasp will be made by our brothers at the Bauhaus. And it will be forged with this and enameled and gilded. And then the next letter is, um, I think, Alfgang going, yeah, and I know a publisher and I'm good at um, doing some graphic layouts. If you want to have your submissions on, like, A4 paper, we're going to, like, roughly this sort of dimensions, I'll be collating it and we can, um, I'm a bit worried about the paper shortage. Yeah, (laughs) it all gets like that. The book, the book of eternal joy for all pure of heart. It should not contain anything about gain or profit, things in short which derive from money, wealth and the hunger for power. It must be a promise for the simplest of men. It must cause wealth to be given away in handfuls. It must promote ideas and proposals that will unite nations. It must be a book such as can only come out of the womb of a nation that lies grovelling in the dust, like the German nation. Which poets feel misery so deeply as those of a conquered people? Search, friends, for these burning-hearted poets whose glowing eyes await their hour of proclamation. So it's not really a proposal that a publisher would sort of accept in the normal course of things, is it? No, but that's not. kind of how everyone else and, interprets and it. And he, he's really irritated <laughs> all the way through. He's like, this like, isn't the book. No, this isn't, <laughs> isn't the book. <laughs> um, and, and actually, he's, um, he's one of the major figures. And he's this... And he's a he's a lovely artist who's worked as an architect and produces these beautiful images. And he's been producing images about force and nature for quite a while. And he's living way out in the middle of nowhere where he's being sort of sponsored by a, a millionaire carpet manufacturer. So he feels really cut off in his rural community. Yeah, he is one of the sort of provincials who's brought into the group by the exhibition. He's in a little... A town, sort of town in uh, Schleswig-Holstein called Itzenhoer, and he's he's as you say he's there f- for one reason only, which is that he has a rich patron there who keeps him, and he runs a little kind of design business along with his wife, which makes a whole series of different things. And he's a very endearing character. Uh, he's someone who comes across very lovely. When when people suggest things, he's like, right, let's do it. Roll up my sleeves. You've got to tell me. You've got to tell me when you get started, so I can clear the decks. He is the um, both the kind of the best intentioned and the truest true believer, I think, in the project. And he is one of the last to become disillusioned with it. He produced before the war. Um, this is not part of it, but uh, he produced this amazing folio of etchings called uh, Schaffende Kräfte, Creative Forces which are these extraordinary landscapes of uh, kind of dancing oceans and huge mountains filled with kind of caves and crystal inhabitations of different sorts. But, yeah, his, his idea is he wants to actually implement. So, Or he at least wants to actually try and do it. 
Yeah. He's like taking all this crazy stuff that Tout is proposing and he's saying, let's have a go. Let's do it. Yeah, Bruno said we're going to overthrow it. We're going to create a new world. I think the best way to create a new world is to, you, you say you want this vision. vision. So let's get on and, and make this visionary thing. So the, the book and the exhibition which it goes with, entitled uh, Ruf zum Bauen, Call to Build, is the main public output of the project. Yeah, and its, its creation is, is the turning point. What happens is, via that sort of three-step process, one of the people makes a call for submissions, and they gather together material, and he sort of produces a book. And then after it, they're not quite the same time, another lot of work is produced and expanded upon and put into a public exhibition. And this is the point when everyone who does make a contribution makes a contribution then, and you get, it's like one of those, like we're starting a new record label, um, like sampler discs. It's got like one track from everybody and you get to see everybody's different sort of takes. And it's this, it's, that is the moment when the crystal chain really exists. You know, people are feeling optimistic and they're doing something um, and then they do it. And um, the book is not particularly successful and the exhibition is modestly successful. Although, I mean, they all say loads of people came and loved it, yeah. but the critics are a bit unsure. And it's at this point that in some ways... The rot sets in, particularly with the sort of outer group, the people who were contributed the odd thing and, and were, were really people. I mean, they'd been brought together through an open submission to an exhibition. They knew how to do open submissions to exhibitions. They knew how to make stuff. That was, that was the one thing that had like brought them all together in the first place. They do that. And that's about the only thing they sort of had an instinct for doing, I think. Trying to think about it from their point of view, do they just not recognise that in the context of the kind of near collapse of the economy, incredible shortages and privations, everybody thinking about um, the, these kind of practical needs for alleviation of poverty and all of these sorts of things, that visionary architecture is not what anybody wants to see at the moment. Are they just so in their own well, I think world? People, I think people did like images of visionary architecture. I think it was popular. I think it is actually an era in which there is a constituency for the avant-garde. Before the programme, we were discussing all the silent films of the era, and they're quite avant-garde. But they are not what Tout wanted to be, which is a programme for seriously reconstructing the nation. Um, I don't think anyone was into that. I think people at this point were feeling exhausted and in need of stability. There's a really interesting letter in the collection by Hans Luckart, Angkor, in which he reflects on the success or failure of the exhibition and also gives a kind of critique of what some of the different participants... Taking you all in turn. Yeah. These are the things that are bad about you. (laughs) So shall we go through some of them? Yeah. At our exhibition, the Vorwärts critic Shikovsky said to Glass, I don't understand your viewpoint. This has often been said to me in the past by people who, I must admit, sympathise entirely with our ideas. I would like to try to consider the reasons for this question rather more closely. Where I think one of the things he's picking up on is this tension between their like idealistic socialism and the more kind of materialistic turn which is taken everywhere else. And he talks about things, he talks about the Russian Revolution. He mentions the Taylor system. He thinks that in the future, uh, mass production is going to be fine and it's going to be good yeah. and we're going to make the full use of that. But we've got to create a new society around understanding efficient production so that's actually a long criticism of tout actually that we're not going to we're not going to wind back the clock on industrialization yeah. there's a, the, i think the last sentence of it is quite telling without having been a city dweller glass yeah. could never have proposed a transformation of the cities yeah. which is a thing we've already talked about like in the episode but like this is yeah, yeah, yeah. he's um he's like nailing he he nails everybody now to Prometh. He goes to the furthest limits in his artistic creation. The drawings are dashed off with the greatest fantasy in individual details. In large numbers, however, they are monotonous. For this reason, it was in his best interest not to exhibit too much of the same thing. Last year at Neumann's, one whole room out of three was devoted to him, which did not prove successful. Yes, other people have commented on the fact that he seems to get this huge collection of um, very similar images. He does his best to like take them seriously, though. He does kind oh, of. Oh, it's it's <laughs> it's real like passive aggressive tutor stuff. Yeah. It's yeah. real like 
I was having a bit of deja vu there when someone shows you something. It's like, like this is really like, rubbish. Well, Ooh, I'm really well, gonna I really gonna try and take this seriously. Again, the criticism, it would be desirable for Anfang to adapt his forms to real contemporary buildings in order to make them more widely understandable. Then, yeah, Sharoon gets a bit. The work of Hannes starts out from great architectural ideas but end in painterly images. The opinions were divided about Tancred. Those who favour the, <coughs> those who favor the trend towards sketchiness in art were enthusiastic. Most of the architects reacted coolly to the drawings. Again and again, he attacks people for not having worked things out in detail. Because he's the person who works things out most in detail. Except that he doesn't, actually. Have you looked at his image? It's, <laughs> it's like a whirlwind with a sort of bubbling spire, which he's clearly worked out very detailedly. It's like a vortex of kind of waves. And then, yeah, there's a sort of classic crystalline uh, bundle of spires in front of it. How do you think he should apply it to actual contemporary buildings, as he's suggesting other people should? Well, he could put a little man in there, and then we'd know how big it is. Yeah. Um, or a motor car. After all, what building <laughs> isn't improved with a vortex? With, a vor- with an enormous planet-sucking vortex. He says that he'd wanted to let the exhibition travel, but that Tout has pulled his work out of it, and that the quality isn't good enough. Without him. Without him. And then he makes this proposal that if they're going to communicate their ideas to the public, they need to start making them understandable. And he has this suggestion that they should actually tackle some recognisable building type. But Tout explicitly wants to do the other thing. He says there's no point in proselytising to the public. Exhibitions are a waste of time now. He said the only possible reason why we should have done an exhibition is because it might attract one additional like-minded spirit. But there's no point showing off to everyone else. But this doesn't make any sense because the whole rhetoric has, so far has been that they're going to come up with a, this idea of yeah, such but beauty whenever... that it's going, to, it's going to inspire everyone. And With doubt, whenever he does anything, yeah. he disdains it because it's less than his dream. So after the exhibition, a lot of people fall away a bit. The correspondence starts to become more about the real kind of hardcore. Yeah, I mean, I think it doesn't help that Tout has said... We're not making any more books. We're not doing any more exhibitions. Yeah. He has to be in control of it, but he just keeps changing his mind. He can't make up his mind about what the plan is. Yeah. So it's, well, not even what the plan is, what he actually desires. Yeah. So it's in this, in this later part, uh, in July, after the exhibition has, is over, that we get... He's had another idea. Tout's had an idea. He's had another idea of, what, <laughs> of, how, of how to bring the... Um, how to bring the idea to the masses. It, it is in his own words. It's a, a treatment for a film. Yeah. Which, in he's, his been own to the, words, he's been to the pictures. Yes. <laughs> the elevator pitch for which is a spectacular fairy tale film spanning 2,000 years, written by Bruno Tout. <laughs> How much of this do you want to have? <laughs> oh, loads. <laughs> Notes on the style of this production. The film will at no point be interrupted by gaps for titles. Scene changes to be made instantly or through gradual blending with one picture growing out of another. The characters will neither speak nor write. Everything will be done through pantomime gestures and rhythmic movement, a wealth of images that will seem like a spiritual reflection made up of movement and gestures. The whole film, therefore, will not be stylized in an expressionist way, but the nature in it will be natural and the art artistic. The art in question will be architecture, as it is the purest reflection of spiritual impulses. This will be ensured by the participation of so-called fantastic architects Finsterlin, Brookman, Gush, Crail, Max Tout, Sharoon, Harblick, Bruno Tout, W and H. Lookhart. So, the title of the film is The Shoes of Fortune. The Magic Shoes. Shall I do like a, a brief gloss? Downtrodden working man. He's there in the streets. He's like broken. He's walking out. He wants a new life in the country. The industrial city is no more for him. He passes his girl. She's looking hollowed. They're trudging. Somehow he's got this mysterious telescope. He looks through this mysterious telescope and sees a fairy dancing around with some bright shoes. Oh, no, no, he, yeah, he, sees, he sees as if through a telescope. Oh, as if through a telescope. <laughs> well, actually, at the, end, at the end, he has got a mysterious telescope. He sees a boy bathed in sparkling light and looking like good fortune itself, standing on the road beside which he places a pair of shoes. Yeah, so anyway, he's, he goes up to these twinkling shoes, which are, like, glowing, 
And um, he looks at his own shoes, and his shoes are bad, and those shoes are good. And he puts those shoes on, and boof! He's transported to the year 2000. <laughs> Guess what it's like in the year 2000? It's like lovely glass architecture is everywhere. Is there glass architecture? Yes, I'm sure there is. Do the houses open with buttons? <laughs> what? Are there, yes. Are there, like, um, uh... What, what was it in the sheer butt? Does does the idle host press with his foot on the foot plate and the door revolve with uh, revolving um, crystals and uh, kaleidoscopic effects to imitate a flunky? I suspect it does. It does, it does. <laughs> and he meets this like odd um, sort of reflection of himself. And the house is amazing and they go around some amazing architecture, blah, 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 all very much on the theme that you've heard before. Yeah. And then... Meanwhile, back in 1920, the girl finds another pair of shoes. Yes, she meets the um the same fairy who offers her various pairs, some the same as the ones that the boy has put on and some different. And uh, she puts some on, some other ones, and... Boof! She's in the year 3000! <laughs> and this building isn't glass architecture, it's fire architecture. All the buildings are made of flames. A, f- a fantastically lively display of fire and sparks, a cascade of water, a fire bathing party. She stares into the fire, she's having a lovely... She's deeply moved and weeps. Uh, and then the fairy comes and strokes her and she falls asleep. Yeah. And then they go to the fairy's house and there's loads of shoes in it. Yeah. Um, he's got all these shoes, 1875, 700, you know, 50 bazillion. Uh, and they find their right shoes... And they put the old shoes back and they go back to 1920 and um, they stare at the beautiful, you know, Bavarian hills or whatever and decide to be the new good farmers of the future and embrace the crystal dream. Yeah. Basically. They go to make it happen. Yeah. They go to bring the future to the past. Yeah. They're not like the boorish farmers of old. How many boorish farmers do you think Tout had met? Uh, I don't know, maybe one. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't like him very much. <laughs> And then there's this very poignant letter which he gets immediately from Harblick saying, um, well, he says something quite strange. He says, delighted at your film idea, especially as I devised something similar about eight years ago. Yeah. <laughs> it's always a good What start. a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> and then he like, yeah, what's kind of poignant about it is he's like, great, let's try and make it happen. I want to make, like, uh, yeah, he's like, I want to make these sets. I'm, I'm going to make an underwater house, an air house with aeroplanes and what's his other one? He's got three. Um, yeah, houses by the sea, in the sea, in the mountains, in the high alps, on on the plain, in quicksand, in rock, inside a mountain, and flying in the air. And then he goes on really to describe the underwater and water one. Yeah. And he does something which is incredible, which is he actually goes into, like, the bits he describes is the building of them. Yeah. The scenes he imagines are the construction of these things, which is done in an ecstatic spirit. And for him, the film is the book now. Yeah. So we're going to have a new the book, and the book is going to be the film. And that's going to inspire... Everyone's going to be like, I want to be one of those toiling masses. And this is... I mean, and I think, in, you know, they've obviously observed that people like going to the pictures and that they, they might... Yeah. They are in, it's propaganda. They want to do propaganda. They're just sort of wondering how to... So we should say just a, a word or two on context, that this is a time in which actually avant-garde architects, architects with whom they have sympathy, are actually involved in filmmaking and in building sets. The most notable example is Hans Pultzig, the arch- who was a successful architect and had built um, this big concert hall, which I think is one of the few buildings that they could all, that certainly some of the people in the group express a lot of admiration for. Yeah. Lookhart talks about it as, uh, in his letter where he talks about the, the the people who are on the um like conservative edge of the group like yeah, it yeah they think they think it's really amazing and uh yeah the, the, something which the architecture can inspire aspire to anyway Pultzig builds the sets for it's for this film called the golem the golem and how he this came what, into this world this is what uh luke really really likes i love the golem it's a very it's a, lo- it's a lovely film it's not completely wild for him to think that this is something that he might get involved in it's yeah. just that tout goes off his idea of doing a film about a week later he decides no i don't like films anymore even the good films like the ones that well were like caligari which he'd actually seen they're just they're little better than mimes and he also says 
they could never re-achieve the glory of his film, which is the kaleidoscope in um, The Glass House. And he says, nothing nothing film could do could ever be as good as that. And this is a popular sort of avant-garde thing. Avant-gardes across Europe briefly flirt with the cinema when it is created, and then are horrified by the outcomes. Well, what happens afterwards? It's not after the exhibition that the correspondence ends. It doesn't. It just really gets... I think it's only four people that write any letters at all after the film, and only really three substantially. And they are Bruno Taut, Fenzel Harblick, and Finsterlin. And Core interjects. So this is a new member who joins the group after the exhibition. Core is Hart, and it's um, his name is, I think, Albert Brust. He's yeah. a playwright. His role in the later part of the correspondence is just to try and enable and bring these people together. But it doesn't really work. They just carry on. And the later letters are kind of rattling around echoes, right, of these three enthusiasts. Prameeth carries on writing the same sort of rambling manifestos that he'd always been writing. Bruno Taut keeps commenting on them. And Wenzel Harblick. And it ends basically with Prometheus just writing more letters on his own in the dark. He's just dancing by himself. He hasn't noticed anything has changed. There has there'd been this invitation from Core to for uh, he he says quite sensibly to everyone, "Ah, uh, why don't you say what you actually want?" <laughs> in in ideally simple, yeah. clear, clearly simply state what it is you're interested in. So the remaining the kind of remaining participating members each do a little they each do a little manifesto, except they're not. Then- Prometheus is like another doorstop. Exactly the same as all the other ones he's done. Tout does something, uh, one called, uh, you know, My World View. And Wenzel Harblick does uh, the clearest iteration of what he wants the book to be. So we haven't actually read anything from Finsterlin, but maybe we should just read his last letter, which is the last part of the correspondence sent on Christmas Eve of 1920. Was it not at the solstice that the seed capsule, the human arc of our unique symbol, the homely ship born of a strong world, landed on Ararat? Aren't we ourselves this Arcanum, the Trojan seahorse pregnant with all the future possibilities of our rotating sphere? Are we not that thing which pours forth from all the stony floods of the earth, that which the divine whisk stiffens from the rivulets of all the sinning waters of the world? The sea and the rock, we ourselves are the two poles, I and we, spiralling and soaring upward, like our divine father, in a never-ending interplay above the molten stony sea and a frozen ocean, borne by the breaths of our outsmarted world eagle, concealing in a golden crown capsule the holy victorious seed of the creation through all the winters and nights, great or small. On the day of the turning earthly sun, let us commemorate our existence and our desires. Let us renew the pledge of our brotherhood to be and to remain the purest creation of the one central divinity." Your Prometh. And if you um, imagine that going over sort of eight or nine pages, you've got almost every... Yeah, by yeah. I mean, that's like, that's the that's what they're all like. And that, with this call to, like, brotherhood and the renewal... Unity and, renew- and renewal. It's, <laughs> it, that's it. It's over. So should we talk about what happens afterwards? Because this kind of is where the glass dream ends. Part of the reason it ends is that um, people are starting to get jobs. The long summer holiday of war is over. Yeah. Also, something is happening in modern architecture, starting to coalesce around this thing which will become identified as like functionalism and the international style. Technological, efficient, interested in industrial production. And also with a real dominating aesthetic. Probably ten years after this are the period of the fairly unchallenged dominance of white oblongs. So kind of important that there's a, a sort of a, an incompatible form of rhetoric, which is technocratic. That modern architecture is the way it is because of the kind of advances in yeah, they, technology. The thing is, the other the... guys come up with an intellectual framework. The intellectual framework, which Brute count, count, cannot... And the, and, the, and the intellectual is the advancement of sort of... Taylorism, right? I mean, it's like functionalism. A house is a machine for living is the slogan which 
does down a house is an empty void of inspiration. So in this book, uh, in Ian Boyd White's book on Bruno Tout, he identifies two factors. One is the one that we're talking about already, that actually for the architect, it's much more, this is a much more defensible position, having a technological argument around function, around efficient use of resources. As an expert and as a professional, all those things kind of tie together in a way like scientific issues, which you understand better than anyone else. And it's a much better place to be. Whereas, you know, if someone is just unconvinced by your claim to be the Messiah, then obviously that... <laughs> Bit of a busted <laughs> but, flush. Yeah. The other one, which is quite interesting, is that he thinks he identifies the creation of this thing called the Lunar Park in Berlin, which is a vast, glassy, spiky, expressionist-styled theme park as a key factor in the the kind of devaluing of this particular architectural vision because it's become crude it's become associated with advertising it's become popular it's and gone, therefore it's, it's no gone longer into pure film and popular culture tout's vision of activist architecture and the people around him i think is something which could only burn out it was a flame that could only burn out because it had it has just too many internal contradictions in it at too many levels like at the really basic level it bases itself on the notion of utopian socialism but it is an avant-garde elitist movement that has no interest in talking to the people aesthetically it is all about crystals and bling but it wants to be resolutely highbrow and whenever people go ooh, shiny crystals he thinks like, Ugh, Ugh. Ugh. you know, she, she, actually Shearbart made this argument that, you know, it's no argument against glass that it um, fascinates it ch- children, children, yeah. children and the simple minded but or something. Not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But that's not yeah. what Tao and, no, and he, those guys are like. Building is serious. Yeah. If you, if you say that your models can't come from nature yeah. and they've got to come from pure rationality, they cannot then be stupid. It def- it doesn't it isn't defeated by the external movements. We see the external movement going on, but it's not that there is a conflict between these people and like the the, the forces that become the Bauhaus yeah. and international modernism. That's not what occurs. It so. burns out on its own. So I think we should talk a little bit about what happens next. So the I think in 1921, probably quite shortly afterwards, Tout becomes the city architect for Magdeburg, which is a job he does for. Um, Oh, until the run-up of the Nazis, really. He's apparently quite good at it. He does some nice buildings. Yeah, there's no, he does some nice things, but he also does lots of quite... Um, Sensible bits of city sen- planning yeah. thing. Painting the buildings. He yeah. paints a lot of the buildings on the high street, he d- different he, colours. He does a good job of like yeah. um, of a sports hall and a sort of... Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a like office. There's this symbolic moment which which kind of marks the direction which modern architecture has taken, which is that the... Deutsche Werkbund has another exhibition, finally. This time they build a housing estate, and the um, Weissenhof Siedlung, and all the houses are these little white boxes. Rather delightful. All di- all, like, all very different, but they're all... Well, they're all very different, but also all astonishingly similar. Yeah, they're all in that style. That's where the world has moved to. And actually, it, we enter a period when... Um... Intellectual architecture, briefly, I mean, people mistake how long this goes on for, briefly enters really one of its most unified phases in the whole of its history. This being the Weimar Republic, it all starts to go off the rails a bit during the 1930s, and he's forced to flee the country, first to Russia. Briefly, but he really dislikes the Soviet Union. Yeah. And so he, I think he goes there for about a week and then comes straight back. He's horrified by it. He's horrified by what is by then Stalin amid the Great Purge. Yeah. Well, it's the Great Purge is like 31 to 33. Yeah, it was a really bad time to move to the Soviet Union. <laughs> it was not a good period. So he came straight back and then then went again to... Oh, we haven't said, but he was Jewish as well as being a socialist. So yeah. He was, it, was a, it, was not a, it was not good news for what? him. What? Tell me. Now, Hitler was a man with strong opinions. What did he not like? What are the things like that he talked about every single speech? He hates modern art. He hates Jews. Socialists. Got the trifecta. (laughs) 
Um, people forget just how much he hated modern art. Yes. It was something he talked about almost as much as the Jews he hated yeah. modern art. So he went to Japan? Yep. Which is kind of like a sort of fascinating And he wrote um, his moment. best-selling book there. Yeah, he's he's responsible, or like he's certainly the originator of the fascination which modern architects of that period developed for certain Japanese buildings, particularly the Katsura Palace. He says that Japanese architecture embodies the greatest and the worst of the human spirit. The greatest being the Katsura Imperial Detached Villa and the worst being the tomb of Nobunaga. Yes, um, Nobunaga at, Oda. At, um, at Nikko, I think. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, which is very... Yes, that's the period when it's like very, very highly decorated Bling. and gaudy and gold Ooh, and stuff. Lots yeah. of twiddles. No, he liked all the... Um, all it's the funny lo- how all the... All the, all the, all the t- but if you look at, like, in that book... Yeah. Everything is encrusted in Yeah, triples. it's weird, isn't it? But he, he <laughs> and nothing is about harmony. Nothing is about, like, these sort of exquisite minimalism and um, roofs resting on crooked and, branches and things. And formalism and sort yeah. of, um, you know, form of similar, um, yeah. you know, limited colour palette. No, it's all bling in his stuff. He also, he did build some buildings there. I'm not, I think one... I think two things survive. A house extension yeah. and yeah. something else. Like, which I have never seen a photograph of, even. And that he then moved on again to Turkey. Turkey, um, where he was well received by the regime, yeah, um, and almost became a sort of court modernising architect for Ataturk. Yeah. Um, he had some considerable commissions there, yeah. built a school and a university, but was only there for a few years and was sort of falling into slightly ill health. And uh, then Ataturk dies, his great sponsor, and his he, he actually designs. The catafalque, the the carriage to carry Ataturk's coffin at his funeral, which is a modernist oblong. And then straight away he dies. Yeah. Two weeks later after the the funeral. Yeah. He's buried in like a big state cemetery in Turkey. And I think is the only non-Muslim there. Well, thanks for listening. Please write to us and let us know what you think. Um, Thanks for the review. Someone gave us a review that we didn't know. Yeah. Unless it's unless it's one of our friends under a pseudonym. Yeah. Thank you for that. And uh, we're <laughs> we're working on imp- making incremental improvements to the sound quality. Yes. We uh, a lot of the problems which are obvious are also obvious to us. Um, I'm sorry for not having kept up with uploading images. There's a big backlog of amazing stuff we want to put up. Follow me on Twitter. I'm at T. Luke Jones. The podcast is at, at about underscore buildings. I'm not sure what we're going to do next. So we might we might be doing we might be doing Aldo Rossi next. We better do some buildings. At some yeah. Point. But yeah, spherical glass greetings yeah. to all of you. Our gra- we are all uh, glass yeah. brothers. Yeah. But we leave, yeah. Lucky slippers greetings. Lucky slippers greetings. <laughs> the you know the healing light of the crystal star fall upon all of you yeah bye 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 bye